welcome to the Explaining History podcast and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the developing relationship between America uh, and Palestine as it was in 1946 and then later the State of Israel after 1948 and the uh, impact that the Holocaust and the fate of the Jews in Europe had on Harry Truman and American public opinion in general. Now, one of the texts that I'm drawing from at the moment is um, Victor Sebastian's uh, 1946, um, a really interesting set of vignettes uh, of the year 1946 in which he contends that um, the post-war era was really born. This is a very uh, significant and uh, important year. You know, a claim you can make about any year, really, in, uh, in the 20th century. There's never a dull moment, really. Um, but it is um, a, a, a very kind of uh, compelling read and one uh, well worth having um, to uh, draw into because the kind of the eclecticism um, of the, the topics uh, covered. Um, the story begins with the dispatch of a group of American relief workers to Europe um, led by one Earl Harrison. Harrison had been um, a, a dean of uh, Pennsylvania University Law School. He was a Methodist, teetotal, a, uh, a Roosevelt supporter, but uh, a Republican to boot, um, and had served in the war as the Commissioner of Immigration and Naturalization. Um, he was the ideal character for Truman to send to Europe. Now, previously, if you've listened to this podcast, I've talked about Truman in the years sort of 45 to 47 as having quite a weak grasp on world events uh, when we talk about the foundations of the CIA. One of the reasons for its uh, creation in the first place or the creation of a, an information service, which is really what Truman was looking for, was that uh, Truman was not a foreign policy expert uh, in any way um, to the level that Roosevelt had been and um, required diligent and reliable uh, sources of information. Harrison was one of those to some extent. Um, Harrison went to Europe, um, some very bleak reports about the fate of Jewish people in Europe. Uh, some of them were riddled with inaccuracies. Uh, some of them um, had a number of painful home truths to tell. Harrison was chosen for this task because before the war, uh, during the 1930s, he had raised money to help Jews escape Nazi Germany and resettle in the US. And he had done this as a, a church uh, man, a Methodist, who was um, working through Christian charities to help um, persecuted Jewish people. Uh, in 1945, or 1946, it was not high on the list of priorities of Harry Truman or any other Western leader. Uh, the fact of the matter was that both Truman and Churchill and later Attlee were well aware that there were abundant anti-Semites in America and Britain, and it was important to not encourage the uh, belief that the war had been fought in the interests of Jewry. There's a very interesting um, book, I've mentioned it before, Thinking the 20th Century, Conversations Between Tony Judd and Timothy Snyder, and Tony Judd has some very revealing things to say about a, a, a Jewish uh, life in Britain in the 1950s, growing up a Jewish boy um, in, in Britain and experiencing um, more anti-Semitism than most British people were comfortable admitting actually existed. And the same was true uh, in, in the USA. So Harry Truman was not, um, the, the Jews were not high on uh, Harry Truman's list of priorities and Truman was aware, obviously well aware, uh, of the Holocaust um, but it had not, by any means, in the in, in the late nineteen forties, moved centre stage in American public discourse whatsoever. The um, really uh, excellent book, um, "The Holocaust Industry and uh, Beyond Hutzpah by Norman Finkelstein, uh, makes the point that actually 
uh, the main um, civic bodies within Jewish American life wanted to uh, be slightly distant from the question of Israel. They, they had, there was an anxiety that uh, the Jews had been murdered en masse in Europe and similar things could happen anywhere. They could potentially happen in America if the Jews were made to feel unwelcome enough. And tying one's colours to a foreign power, um, and in the tumult of the cold, the early days of the Cold War, it was not abundantly clear that Israel would become an American satellite. It might rather unfortunately become a Soviet one, and then American Jews would be uh, tarred by American anti-Semites um, as being intimately connected with a new uh, Soviet satellite uh, in the Middle East. So... Understandably, uh, senior figures within the uh, American Jewish community were very cautious about Israel uh, to begin with, uh, and about before Israel, about Jewish migration to the British Mandate of Palestine. Because of Truman's lack of knowledge of the conditions um, and the realities of Jewish life in Europe after the Holocaust, um, Harrison was able to exert a great deal of um, influence over Truman. Um, Harrison, as mentioned, sent back um, hard-hitting reports and he um, said essentially uh, that uh, the US should support um, a Jewish state, that's a Jewish homeland, as was um, the, the wording of the Balfour Declaration, which um, allowed for... Uh, Jewish migration into Palestine, originally from 1917 onwards, um, said that there could be a Jewish homeland and it was suitably um, ambiguous as to what that meant. Classic bit of uh, British imperial uh, diplomacy and doublespeak. Here Harrison said that there needed to be a Jewish state and this um, would put quite a lot of pressure on uh, Anglo-American relationships uh, at the end of the war. And some of the um, shocking accounts of how Jews were still being um, prevented from leaving Europe to go to uh, Palestine and the uh, camp conditions in which they were uh, kept. There were many Jews who were still in the uh, camps that had imprisoned them uh, the uh, concentration and uh, not the death camps, they were uh, destroyed or occupied by the Soviets, but the camps such as Bergen Belsen and Sachsenhausen um, were then used, turned into essentially displaced person camps, uh, ones with particularly hideous memories uh, for the Jewish people who were stuck there. He said, As matters now stand, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. Uh, I would say that this is uh, a wild exaggeration. It's true that the British were quite heavy-handed with Jewish evacuees um, who attempted to reach Palestine, who were turned back and had to be uh, housed in Europe somewhere. Uh, the uh, out the out of use uh, camps, such as uh, Sachsenhausen were reopened and Jewish prisoners were kept there and when they rioted in one particular notorious incident uh, the British soldiers actually turned fire hoses on them. Now one would be forgiven for thinking that the sole reason for Jewish people leaving Europe was the memory of the recent Holocaust. Well that's not quite the case. The idea that Jewish people were leaving Europe in large numbers because of a horrific event which they had survived um, isn't the full picture. The reality was in not just Eastern but Western European com countries as well, uh, violence, uh, murder, assault and uh, robbery were being perpetrated on Jewish people still by civilian populations and newly liberated governments and um, the Jewish people of Europe um, with some degree of justification felt that Europe was not a safe place for them even though the Nazis had been vanquished. 
This one, this really accounts for between 1945 and 1948 the. Uh, outflow of really most of the remaining uh, diaspora Jews from Europe. Some of Harrison's reports were full of inaccuracies. Uh, he seemed to think that there had been gas chambers at Belsen. There hadn't. Belsen was many things, but it wasn't a death camp. Um, it was a concentration camp that at the end of the war becomes uh, full of Jewish prisoners who had been, who'd survived uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau and had been marched westwards and the huge influx of um, prisoners led to a mass outbreak of disease and that was one of the main killers in the last days at um, Bergen-Belsen, not um, Zyklon B gas. So you have to wonder what, how valid some of the things that Harrison was saying uh, actually are. He said... Many Jewish refugees are, being, are living under guard behind barbed wire fences in camps of several descriptions, including some of the most notorious, amidst crowded and sanitary conditions, in complete idleness with no opportunity except surreptitiously to communicate with the outside world, waiting, hoping for some word of encouragement and action on their behalf. And Harrison was explicit in what he wrote. He said that the Jewish people are a nation and they should be treated as such. The reality for many Jews across Europe is that their sense of national identity had been Greek or Polish or Dutch or German, and they and, and this had been how they had seen themselves. Primo Levi famously wrote, the, the Italian uh, Jewish Holocaust survivor, famously wrote at the end of the Holocaust, um, the end of the war, uh, when he made it back to uh, Turim, that he was had been an Italian before the war, but now, because of the Nazis, he could be nothing other than a Jew. His um, ability to feel um, welcome or assimilated into a, another nation-state uh, was gone, and all he was left with was his Jewish identity, which was one that he had really subsumed in favour of uh, a, more, uh, a more integrated Italian sense of self. Uh, so... If that, sen if that belief by um, Harrison is correct, and it seems like a, a broad oversimplification without asking uh, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people uh, how they viewed themselves as in a sense of nationhood, it's difficult to know. But, that, but other avenues of nationhood had certainly been stripped away from a great many Jewish people when they went home to uh, their countries of origin they were still told by many civilians there who had been occupied by the Nazis, we don't want you, you're not welcome. Of course not in all cases, but it was quite prevalent. Harrison made a recommendation in his report to Truman, um, which was problematic for Truman and almost impossible to resolve for the British. Um, he said that 100,000 Jews uh, were, should be admitted to Palestine immediately. The problem that the British had was that since 1917, mass Jewish immigration into Palestine had led to an uh, Arab revolt, which had to be mercilessly suppressed. And then the uh, banning of Jewish migration into Palestine from 1937 onwards um, had resulted in a low level and then uh, towards the end of the war, increasingly high level guerrilla warfare waged by Irgun and the Stone Gang and uh, other such organisations, um, the most significant figure behind those being obviously Menachem Begin. Now, I did do a podcast a long time ago on Menachem Begin, and you can look it up, uh, but he'll definitely be making a reappearance fairly shortly. Harrison's 100,000 figure uh, seems to have been plucked from thin air, and he has um, not really been able to um, speak to large numbers of Jewish people in the camps. He interacted with a few Jewish leaders, um, but he didn't know anything about Palestine. He was unable to comment whether uh, Palestine could absorb 100,000 new immigrants, and he didn't seem to know anything about the uh, Arab revolt before the, first, before the Second World War. So the figures that were being sent to um, a largely uh, impressionable Truman, who was uh, quite taken in by uh, 
what Harrison had to say, were hypothetical at best. Harrison, who doesn't seem to have liked the British very much, didn't make any effort to speak to uh, British officials in Germany or Palestine, certainly didn't speak to any Arabs, and he uh, was largely unconcerned, it would appear, uh, with the question of uh, Arab nationhood in Palestine. He saw things in terms of uh, a simple moral solution, which you can forgive the man for um, wanting, having seen the condition of Jewish people in camps and the uh, kind of the, the stain on the world's conscience. Uh, it's entirely possible that he, he believed that there were simple moral solutions, but obviously they there weren't. Uh, the entire question of what to do with Palestine. Uh, was uh, incredibly complicated. Uh, the British had got themselves into an appalling mess there due, due to the various um, problems with created uh, from the Balfour Declaration onwards. And short of washing their hands of it, and I've done a number of podcasts on this one um, about the partition of Palestine. Uh, I did that one a couple of months ago. The British have no better ideas. So the idea that um, Harrison, with his limited knowledge, was going to simply call a solution is uh, pretty naive. Rather unfortunately, then, the 100,000 figure became adopted as an article of faith by the Americans. And I don't think Truman looked into where Harrison was getting his statistics from. Truman was moved by Harrison's reports. And certainly Harrison's reports put the question of uh, Palestine in the centre of Truman's thinking, whereas it had once been not even a, a kind of a periphery question. Um, however, Truman's a hard-headed guy, um, and Truman had uh, not a, a magnificent uh, record in uh, treating Jewish people with um, civility, uh, just as he was a, a more than casual racist when it came to black Americans. Um, Truman was a typical kind of casual anti-Semite of his age, much as Roosevelt ha- had been um, referring to smart Hebrews and clever Yids and that kind of thing in his diaries. Uh, I remember a particularly choice comment by uh, Roosevelt who would go to his uh, Hyde Park estate in the summer to get away from all, Jew- all of New York's Negroes and Jews. As was the, uh, the way with these things, the, the White House and the State Department were often divided over what to do. The State Department said that um, the key to controlling the Middle East uh, in the post-war era would be to befriend the Arabs and not to antagonise them. Roosevelt had done a marvellous job of this during the war, um, had uh, sailed to Saudi Arabia and um, courted the Saudi royal family to allow America to buy Saudi oil in perpetuity. And the beginnings of a a philo-Semitism in uh, America, a uh, enthusiasm for the Zionist cause, was just starting to stir at the end of the war. There was a a religious uh, dimension to this, the idea that Um, the Holy Land, uh, the children of Israel must be returned to the Holy Land and that sort of thing. Um, There were in the late 19th, early 20th century in Britain uh, a great many um, Methodist uh, Philo-Semites and um, Anglican Philo-Semites who believed that it was a Christian duty to see the the Jews returned to the the Holy Land. So it's, it's quite a deep part of um, uh, culture surrounding certain um, churches and uh, branches of uh, Protestantism. Anyway, another aspect of this philo-Semitism and uh, the, in, in America and an enthusiasm for the Zionist cause was um, a, a belief that, uh, or as a way of helping Americans to embrace uh, the notion of the good war, that the Jews who had been saved from the Nazis, obviously by the Americans, though you know you have to really kind of go into a, a vast universe of historical fiction 
uh, to ignore the fact that it was the Red Army that liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, anyway, in the minds of um, the, uh, uh, the domestic American population, the war had clearly been fought for to end the tyranny and defeat the bad guys and the Jews had been saved. And this was all good. And so surely Zionism and giving them their own homeland after everything that happened to them was the, the right thing to do. And Truman centred that this was electorally popular. And Truman, for much of his time in office, uh, was uh, fairly poorly received by the American population. Truman uh, agreed that he would put more pressure on the British to allow uh, immigration into Palestine. And, and as I said, we've covered this one previously in the, uh, the, uh, the Partition of Palestine uh, podcast. Uh, Truman said to um, Ibn Saud, king of Saudi Arabia, the uh, Roosevelt's old friend, I have to answer to hundreds of thousands who are anxious for the success of Zionism. I do not have hundreds of thousands of Arabs as my constituents. Now, um, anti-Semitic narratives have always put it that American presidents are influenced by you know, sinister Jewish control of America and all this sort of you know, insane nonsense. The reality is far more mundane than that. The reality is that it wasn't hundreds of thousands of Jews that were putting pressure on uh, Truman, but hundreds of thousands of uh, church-going American uh, Christian people who thought that they, it was only moral that the Jews should be allowed to immigrate into Palestine. However, Truman was also aware that in certain swing states there were um, Jewish minorities who could um, possibly possibly be decisive. There were in fact 4.5 million uh, American Jews by 1945, so this is not an inconsiderable demographic. Not all of those are moved by the case of Israel, but a great many are. And Israel and the uh, Zionist movement had really become more important to American Jews throughout the 1930s. The concept of a Zion is obviously always more appealing when uh, you're not in a country um, that is uh, stable and relatively liberal and relatively prosperous. Um, Jewish people in Poland, for example, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, disputed amongst themselves whether they, they had indeed found Zion. They were relatively well uh, looked after um, in Poland, and they lived in a rel relatively uh, tolerant environment where they felt they could thrive. And Zionists wanting to move to Palestine were often... Uh, in fierce debate with uh, other Polish Zionists who thought, no, well, we, we need to stay put. A more cynical way of interpreting America's enthusiasm for Palestine was the fact that immigration to America from Europe was at its lowest level in half a century by 1945. The returning uh, GIs who were coming back from Europe and the Pacific were guaranteed the first uh, bite of the uh, jobs boom that was happening and the idea that uh, Europeans, uh, European Jews, might flood in and take advantage of America's newfound prosperity was not an attractive thought um, to uh, many Americans who kept their prejudices quite neatly hidden. So sending them to Palestine, making them uh, the British, the, the problem for the British, and um, a, the British by 1945 certainly uh, don't necessarily have uh, a kind of love affair with the uh, American uh, public, especially during the uh, incident of the Keynes loan, which again, I've done a podcast on that if you want to go back and have a look at it. Uh, where there was a, a kind of a, it seems a great scene, a great deal of resentment that the British should be coming over, uh, looking for a cheap loan at the end of the war that America, in the eyes of many Americans, had won for Great Britain, and therefore, uh, with some um, anglophobic Americans dumping the problem of um, Jewish emigration from Europe onto the British Empire, was uh, almost a pleasure. <laughs>
Richard Crossman, who um, later became one of the great figures of the Labour Party in uh, Great Britain during the post-war era, um, a, a supporter of Zionism and a supporter of the US, um, when he visited America in 1946, he said, the average American supported immigration to Palestine because he didn't want more Jews in America. By shouting for a Jewish state, Americans satisfy many motives. They're attacking the British Empire and British protectionism. They're espousing a moral cause for whose fulfilment they will take no moral responsibility. And most important of all, they are diverting attention from the fact that their own immigration laws are one of the causes of the problem. I was irritated in Washington by the almost complete disregard of the Arab case. Only those very few Americans who had experienced of the Middle East showed any understanding of the problem. The rest seemed to take it as self-evident that once the legal title of the Jews to Palestine had been proved, there was nothing else to discuss. They saw Arabs as they saw native Indians, who were a bar to progress and manifest destiny, who would have to be pushed aside as if modernity and progress were to prevail. But this wasn't just a democratic socialist perspective. Lord Halifax, who had uh, was a conservative peer, former conservative foreign secretary, and potential rival for Churchill uh, in Church- with Churchill in 1944, the prime ministership, said, "The average American citizen does not want more Jews in the United States and solves his conscience by advocating their admission into Palestine." Truman wrote to Attlee after having Harrison's report, saying that the British should immediately allow 100,000 Jews into Palestine and that he was prepared to make his support for a Jewish homeland public. He wrote, As I said to you in Potsdam, the American people as a whole firmly believe that immigration into Palestine should not be closed and that a, reason, um, and that a reasonable number of Europe's persecuted Jews should be permitted to resettle there. Attlee responded by saying that grievous harm could be done to Anglo-US relations by putting out a figure which has been formed without consideration of the consequences for the Middle East. Now, in the next couple of days, I'm going to do a podcast on the Irgun uh, gang and the bombing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. And so stay tuned for that. And um, thanks very much for listening. And if you can uh, check out our Patreon page and also give us a good write-up on Explaining History iTunes page. Be much obliged. Thanks very much. Catch you on the next podcast. Bye-bye.